So welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, on this AHA night. I want to give a shout out to AHA New Bedford. They are um, uh, program across New Bedford every second uh, second Thursday of the month and when we had to adjust to going virtual um, we all scrambled and did so so there's a lot of other programming going on tonight um, if you're tuning in live I hope you uh, will check that out I put the the website in the chat and um, if you're watching this as a recording um, please check out aha every second Thursday there's so much going on in this city it's ridiculous some of it is live and in person and some of it is recorded. So um, a nice shout out to AHA. Um, I am Dawn from the Roach Jones Stuff House and Garden Museum. So uh, I'm, I'm host tonight and very happy to have Dan Eberton here. We um, are doing talks virtually through the winter and, um, uh, and I hope you'll come back and, and see us for some of those talks. So um, Dan is our speaker tonight. He was born and raised right here in New Bedford. Uh, he graduated from UMass Dartmouth with a degree in history and a minor in Black Studies. He's also a trained archaeologist. He researches themes of colonization, sex, gender, and print material culture. He has just been accepted to Brown University in the Public Humanities Program, and we're very happy to have him tonight. Dan. Thank you very much, Don. Um, so I will just get right into it, mostly because the slides are probably far more entertaining than me. Uh, so I'm going to start screen sharing now. And let's go into present mode. So to kick us off, I want to say happy LGBTQ History Month. Um, thank you for Dawn and the Bridge Jones Stuff House Garden, Garden and Museum for allowing us to kind of celebrate that and highlight that. And the Queer Arts Council of New Bedford is also hosting a bunch of different programming and highlighting LGBTQ history this month. So who am I? Uh, I did get kind of a little intro. I, again, Dan, my pronouns are he, him. I focus particularly on social media. Um, I mean, <laughs> sorry. I focus particularly on material culture, print, leather, and fabrics are my favorites, uh, colonization, and of course, gender, sex, and sexuality. I'm currently researching not just this stuff here in New Bedford, but about Elias Trotter, who was a whaler who had same-sex relationships on his voyage, and also sex work in ancient Mediterranean societies. And you can see right there, Lucum de Fundo is the New Bedford LGBTQ Plus archive, and I am the community archivist for that, that program. So I really love uh, Marie Egwe's little quote here. It's is very pertinent to our times, so I wanted to kind of open up with that. And that's Marie Equi right there on the, the left. And so I want to say right here that I am a radical socialist. And she gave this at the speech um, in New York in 1914, specifically about um, discussing unemployment and the labor rights and unions and how to address those issues. And so she was just very quite frank about her position and her politics to the to the presentation. So I wanted to kind of talk about Marie before she became a doctor. Uh, we know that she was born and raised here in New Bedford. Her father was John Aki. That's actually, you'll notice there's two different spellings, obviously. Um, Marie decided to do the E instead of the A. And because of the dynamics between Italian and Portuguese and Irish immigrants on speaking, it's technically Aki, but we say Equi for some reason. <laughs> Her mother was Sarah Mullins as well. And during their childhood, she saw a lot of her siblings, especially younger siblings, go through a lot of issues with lack of health care. They died of diseases or some sort of quote unquote unknown cause or a kind of a treatable disease that was going through the city, but they did not have access to that care. And I think that's really informative on how she decided to go into healthcare. And including that, her father had a lot of striking workers come to the house and she would hear their grievances. And we kind of narrowed it down that it most likely was a strike, a strike of 1877 with the Wamsita Mills, which that little postcard right there is for. And let's do, so I actually, of course, do some digging because I love print materials. And I found this little gem at the UMass Dartmouth Claire T. Carney Library Archives and Special Collections. 
and it is a old directory for different laborers and different like basically a list like a phone book if you will back in the day and i found one of the things that in researching history there's always going to be misspellings of different names and so i have to constantly search under very awkward like this is aqua <laughs> of course it's not the correct spelling but it is most likely john uh her father mostly because of the 1850 i mean 185 south second street we do know from hellquest that she was born and um and raised in a house on south second street and i'm not sure i have to check some maps if 185 is the same as it is now or if it was at a different direction when it was back in uh the 1800s but i am that's one thing i'm trying to look for so Early in her life, uh, Bessie Holcomb was probably her first girlfriend that she met in New Bedford High. Uh, Bessie graduated because she was already a senior at the point when they met. Marie was still a freshman. When Bessie graduated, she went to Wellesley, but Marie dropped out to go work in the mills, which is a very typical story of a lot of people well into the 80s that people went to the high school for maybe a year or didn't even go and just ended up working in the mills. Bessie helped Marie get into an actual like, private school, which was Northfield Seminary for young ladies. And she actually paid for her first year. That's actually like going above and beyond most expectations. And sadly, Marie did have to leave because she could not secure a scholarship in time. But Bessie decided to go out west during uh, to Oregon during the kind of big rush of like collecting different land grants that were um, were allotted for homesteaders, and Marie shortly followed thereafter. So that is kind of why we see Marie Ackley like leave New Bedford to go to the West Coast, where she is more prominently known. But I think that New Bedford should start claiming her back. <laughs> Here's a picture of Marie over to the right, and that's actually her daughter that was adopted, Mary. And she didn't stay with Bessie. Um, she ended up marrying for a short time uh, Harriet Speckart, who's the far left over there. This is most likely outside of the courthouse during her trial for sedition, possibly. Um, I've been trying to narrow it down of like, which, because Marie did get arrested quite frequently for her activism. So it is kind of hard to determine which, which trial is this. <laughs> so her activism really went across many boards, but they were very intersectional in that we see crossovers and um, reasons why it needs to be addressed and that there is links there. Her most prominent, of course, is women's suffrage, but I wanna point out that she did work really hard for labor rights, healthcare access, radical socialism, anti-war, obviously, because of her sedition charge, um, abortion and birth control rights, addressing issues in poverty and fixing it, and also wrongful con convictions and arrests of protesters. So the New Bedford connection, I actually found a few gems with New Bedford, mostly because there is kind of, a, I guess you can say a, like a climax in 1915, but before then, New Bedford and Massachusetts at large were having conversations in the 1870s about women's suffrage. The Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association actually formed in 1877. I believe I, I am horrible with numbers, so I always forget or transpose them, so I do apologize. <laughs> we see later on, there is mention of Marie because she is actually coming back during that time period due to the fact that she's speaking at conferences like the one in New York. She's attending Mass General for a quick post-grad term. And she kind of was famous because she was in a cannery strike in Portland and her father was actually interviewed by the New Bedford Standard and asked like his opinion on it. And he essentially said that his daughter was inclined to be overly enthusiastic about anything upon which she set her mind. So I think her dad was pretty much asserting that like Marie's gonna do what Marie's gonna do. And we also see in 1915, 
there was going to be a large vote to to try and get states to push for a national vote for um, women's suffrage. And at the right here is actually right before the vote, a New Bedford paper was commissioned or paid for this ad by the Massachusetts Anti-Suffrage Association, which profess that like so many women are in our group and they are against voting because it makes no sense and to, to remind people to vote no on this amendment. And it was uh, issued on November 1st, 1915. And you can actually see it at the microfilm collections at the New Bedford Free Public Library. And there's a lot of few more gems that this one, it got cut off by accident when I was saving it, but it was small wins and suffrage loss. So Funnily enough, the wins were uh, liquor licenses <laughs> and, uh, and those policies that were changed during um, Walsh's term in, Ma in Massachusetts, but the suffrage votes were defeated both in Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania. So the article kind of goes into that discussion. And that is probably why we see later on in later November, a kind of rally, if you will, about women's suffrage. So I believe this vote happened, there was a big loss, and to keep momentum up, there was a big push all across the state to kind of still address this issue. And we see the first coverage again begins in 1915 with the failed votes. We have speaking engagements afterward with the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association. I believe that New Bedford was targeted by those printed ads, in part because New Bedford does have a significant population and it is enough of a vote, it, is, it does have enough of a vote matter in New Massachusetts that it was seen kind of as a threat to the Massachusetts anti, Women's Anti-Suffrage Association. But here is actually Esther Woolenson. And I found, you know, uh, Anisha Savina can attest to this, we both kind of did the same looking of like, where was this? And I can firmly say that this rally happened on 8th Street. It is tangentially kind of possible from some sources that I can't really share right here, but that they could not secure a, um, a permit for County or Union Street. And I think they just decided, let's just show up on 8th Street and see what goes, how it goes on. So here's a little uh, Google map because archaeologists love maps. That's one of the things we love. And I point out that the orange circle is where Esther's photo has taken place. But in the next slide, there is a second photo um, that I think takes place in the yellow circle. It is still hard because, again, the landscape has changed, but there is still some, uh, some things that are the same. And if you look to the left of that tan brickish building, that's the New Bedford Public Schools, like Board of Education and Administration building. That's the building that you see, let me go back, there at the end. That is the same stairwell. Uh, you know, when I stood at the same spot, it looked pretty almost identical, which was really uh, thrilling. This is the second photo that I mentioned. You can see, of course, Esther again over there. This was from an old slideshow from New Bedford Whaling Museum um, that I found and dug up from their archives. And as you can see, like the, the kid dragged to the, <laughs> to the march, you know, and the signs are actually interesting because you see them nationally. So it wasn't just the Massachusetts Women's As uh, Suffrage Association that had that. It was kind of almost branded content for a lot of the suffragette movement um, folks. And they basically would just change out, of course, the state. <laughs> So, of course, August 18th happens in 1920, and the 19th Amendment is ratified. So it took five more years until finally women's suffrage uh, happened. However, two months later, with Marie Equi, she was arrested for sedition on October 17th in 1920. She ended up having to serve her time in San Quentin. She, of course, only had to serve about 10 months. She did have good behavior. And she got out on August 9th, 1921, almost a year after uh, um, the Women's Suffrage Amendment. But I wanted to point out that she was pardoned in December 24, 1933. That is significant because 
what probably a lot of people don't realize that a lot of socialists or anti-war effort people and labor union, union rights workers were actually stripped of their citizenship and their actual rights. So during the time period between 1921 and 1933, Maria Kui could not vote. She could not travel with a passport. She could not do a lot of things because her citizenship was stripped because of this, you know, big scare of communists coming in. And that kind of was the argument for these limited rights after being charged with this kind of crime. And it happened to not just Maria Kui, but a lot of people in America during that time period. So I wanted to give, of course, some more resources for more information. Uh, the, one of the big books that I really appreciate and uh, took from was the Michael Helquist one, which is Marie Equi, Radical Politics and Outlaw Passions. The, of course, the New Bedford, um, New Bedford, New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park. <laughs> I don't know why I worked there for so long and I should have like that right off the top of my, the, off the top of my head. But the National Park Service there at New Buffalo Whaling National Historical Park has a great uh, website dedicated to Marie Equi and her impact in New Bedford. The, of course, Oregon, which loves to like claim Marie Equi and really highlights her prominently. They have the Oregon History Project and their historical society as well has a lot of information, a lot of her um, archives and letters from Harriet Specker and whatnot. And of course, the New Bedford Whaling Museum has the Lighting of the Way program and you can see their website specifically, which is historicwomen.southcoast.org. And you can see not just Marie Equi, but a lot of other suffragettes and other women who impacted the city. So I wanna say thank you, the, again, to Roach Jones Duff House and Garden Museum, of course, AHA, and New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park. I wanna shout out again, Park Ranger Anisha Savino, because I will always ask her things about uh, Marie Equi, because she, loves Marie Equi, and New Bedford Free Public Library for access to their materials, and of course the UMass Dartmouth Claire T. Carney Library Archives and Special Collections. So I kept this presentation pretty short, most because I wanted to have a discussion of the women's suffrage movement and just what was going on there during that time period. So I am open for any questions of any of my research or any topics about Marie. Uh, so go so and we are happy to if you would rather stay muted and put your question in chat um, I'll read it so you can either ask it here or I'll put or put it in chat so Francesco did you want to ask a question first of all you're well put you did an awesome job it was really inspiration I really liked it um, this was all new to me I never knew any of this and I just wanted to ask is it possible um do you do any um conversations with groups for rainbow or anything that i could um you know i have a i'm starting a rainbow support group but i'm also attending one and i'm representing um <clears throat> the people with developmental disabilities and i'm with mass advocates standing strong i'm one of their um trainers like um for being a self-advocate and we have a rainbow support group and I would love to um, have you come attend and bring your presentation in. It's phenomenal. Of course, absolutely. You have my email now. You can always hit me up and ask me about that and see if you have a good time for it. But I'm always happy to kind of give presentations, not just about React Week, but any kind of topics in history. Um, I am a nerd and so I've probably given 20 presentations during quarantine. So I'm pretty like now well versed to not just in meet space, but in virtual space too. So I, I feel very happy to be invited elsewhere as well. Yeah, it really like was really inspiration. It really, really was touching. And that's why I said like, um, I would love you to share that. And it was really meaningful. Thank yeah. you for having this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and I want to say thank you, Dan, because um, he, he was here and and uh, part of our program and, and actually he's speaking later this month on the LGBTQ archive that he I think you were solely responsible for this I idea am, right I am pretty much the, uh, the the father and the caretaker and the archivist for it and I have <laughs> it actually quarantine kind of stalled the project a little bit 
but thankfully I purchased quite a lot of the things that you typically get in archive, which is those fancy boxes that preserve um, artifacts and files. And um, so I just have a bunch of empty boxes just sitting in my actual house. <laughs> Um, they are going to eventually live actually at the New Bedford, um, the UMass Dartmouth Special Archives and Collections. So that's our partner where it is a public archive. So anyone can go and request access to these materials. But I am the one that basically is collecting, like quantifying, labeling, and then end product is going to the, uh, to the special collections and archives. Can you, can, I don't know if you know the answer to this, Dan, but um, because these, these are histories that have not been researched or, you know, these are stories that have not been told. Um, do, do you see other cities kind of organizing to collect, you know, more information on their LGBTQ communities? Is it, is it, because um, I, I think I met somebody in Providence that was heading up an effort there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I'm, I'm hoping it's a growing movement. Do you know if it's, if it is? It is. Yeah. Honestly, the, when I was younger, before, uh, before graduating from um, UMass, there was probably only five actually like specific archives for LGBTQ history or either broadly across the nation or city or state specific. Um, most of them are actually located in uh, college campuses. So of course, San Francisco and then UCLA has their own little additional one. Um, one of my favorites is the William Way Archive in Philadelphia. It is actually housed. Also, uh, Bob Skiba is basically like what I do is he's the one maintainer and collector and like uh, uh, interpreter for these collections too. And that is one of the bigger ones as well. And I believe we're the only, I think we're the third in the state. So I know Boston's The History Project is a big, it's the larger one. There is one at UMass Amherst as well, but is pretty specific to the Western Mass area. And then of course mine, um, not really mine, it's the cities. I'm gonna call it the cities because I do believe in public uh, archives, which is a fairly new concept in and of itself too. And I believe that also is um, indicative of that wanting to talk about these histories that are not normally talked about I believe that's why we have this push for public access for archives. Um, you know, now we also have digital efforts, which a lot of the stuff that for this archive is actually gonna be also digital. I have a lot of oral histories that I'm currently transcribing. So like, I'm kind of at a standstill with the archive, but I have some things that I can work on and hopefully uh, have a space to upload so people can listen as well. But it is a fairly new phenomenon, yeah. Um, I think public history is like a, as a major for academic interest is also fairly new. And one of the bigger programs is actually Temple University in Philadelphia and Brown's Public Humanities programs are probably like the two biggest leading people, or leading people, leading schools that are kind of addressing that. Yeah, and I will, um, no one's paying me to do this, but I'll give a plug for uh, Hacking Heritage. I don't know if anyone um, attending has been to it, but they usually do it, I think, in late spring. Um, and it's literally a free all-day program um, with just such great topics. It's an unconference, so they usually um, put out a theme, but then the talks and the presenters are, are arranged that day. And I've, I've gone, I think, three years in a row, and I've never had a bad conference there. I mean, it's Hacking Heritage, you can tell from the title, is um, they're really confronting kind of the cutting edge issues in um, public history and heritage. And Brown, the public humanities program, is a big presence there. Um, I think the professor that organizes it might be from there. So. Uh, I will give them a plug if you're interested in these kinds of topics of um, uh, that ch check them out. They um, they may be going virtual this year. I don't know, but they're worth looking at. Are, are there any other questions for Dan or comments? Yes. Yeah, question. I, I had a question about your directory research. Mm -hmm. You probably knew that was coming. Yes. <laughs> Um, were there any listings for the Aqua, Aqui, Equi family 
um, that were associated with non-residential locations? Like, So from what I could find, so like it was a complete accident that I found two books that had this. Like, Because when I worked at the archives, at the end of the day, I was like, I'm just going to go fiddle around with the books because books are my thing. And, um, and I, so I found two books that mentioned um, one I – I swear to God, I took photos of, and I was so pissed that I couldn't find them. But I did find the, that one. It was the first one was a slim gray book that listed John and um, his brother Dominic, um, or Dominique, Dominico, uh, as stonemasons. Right. And it had, it still had their residential address. Okay. And then the directories also still had the same um, uh, residential address. And so it's interesting that, like, everyone was listed as a residential address and right. so I think a lot of people were like laboring themselves out from their house so like I can only Im imagine like someone looking at this directory and being like I need a carpenter I'm gonna go to Joe Schmo's house knock right. on his door and ask him hey will you work <laughs> for this project and so the the interesting to point to in that directory as you saw there was ads on it. So again, it felt like, like an early phone book. That was the only thing I could like compare it to. Yeah, I had done some directory work um, for one of the presentations I gave on Dr. Equi this quarantine. Um, and I had found, again, some similar addresses. But one of the other things I had seen was some folks who had both a home address and an office address of some sort. Um, I had that saying, I had a thought of like, oh, how would you know which door to go to? Like, it, it's just yeah. an interesting conversation around how business was conducted, right? And Helquist mentions that the South, the South Second Street uh, address was like a family hub. So it was a multiple family home. And then they moved to the West End at James Street, which was a specifically a Marie's a direct family. But it right. was also, a, I believe, a multi-level home as well. And so I... It is interesting because he goes into that. It's very uncommon for like someone to have, own two rental properties, and he owned eventually both the South Second Street right, and yeah. James Street. Yeah. One. Uh, John inherited from Dominic. Yep. And then what's even what's very fascinating too is by the 1880 census, when they're on James Street, and and we have that documentation, they end up also buying uh, an empty lot that's now on Tremont Street. Um, that's cool. So, and I've kind of almost narrowed down which, which house mm -hmm. um, on James. So, we're, you know, we're narrowing down. And uh, so, yeah, just always, I, I'm, all right, I come from a, a, an Italian blue collar Mason family, right? Like I, I actually heard about the Equis from my grandpa before I ever knew Dr. Equi existed, existed because he knew about the Equis as the Italians who built the library like that that's just the oral history from the italian masons in new bedford <laughs> and uh i didn't know there was a connection until i think 2016 2017 mm -hmm. and i keep thinking like my grandpa was a contractor out of his basement and i had been wondering that about john equi as well like are they working out of their home is this still a thing that's happening and i i mean i'm just i'm looking at like the types of labor that Murray would have been exposed to as a kid and like how that would have informed her understanding of labor later on. Um, she, she did grow up in front of the waterfront. And so I'm, I'm absolutely sure she saw like the fish sucking houses, the market there. And so there is obvious evidence that there's a breadth of like labor, not just mill work, but like the general population of Massachusetts, which is invested in, the the wharf and textiles and so um and i remember you mentioned there was a grocery next to her and so i think also the it shop was market Holcomb. it was a Holcomb. Yeah, Holcomb. right yes. they had like the best holcomb's parents and grandparents had multiple uh uh grocers both on south second street and then later on in the west end not far also from the James and Tremont Street properties. So there, I, I actually, I, I want to hypothesize that Bess and Marie knew each other well before high school, mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest. Um, that so is extremely fair because yeah. we do see that where, again, pocket communities, especially by location, we see it today. So like if 
folks you know about New Bedford, there's the South End, there's the West End, and there's the North End. And so, like, I I don't want to say I know everyone in the South End, but, like, I still see the people I grew up with from, like, elementary school, <laughs> and I still run into them. Um, and so I think that is absolutely entirely possible um, that that happened. Go ahead, Francesco. Um, as I said, I'm a self-advocate. Um, so for mass advocates, I just want to ask one thing. Um, are the material, can you photocopy them or you have to like get like verbal permission or something to get the material um, that if you want to say like presented or how do you come about getting the material? So are you speaking about the directory book and the um, the uh, screenshots of the, the newspapers or one or the a little other? like any like a little bit of everything. So uh, that's kind of like a behind the scenes of how historians work. <laughs> um, <laughs> it it really depends. So like I know I work closely with the, the archives and special collections at UMass Dartmouth. So like they were very comfortable with giving me permissions on pretty much anything. And as long as I did not request like, can I just take this book, you know, with me and like go Total outside. Copy. And, um, and, and because of the nature of the material, it is extremely hard to photocopy that. And that's why I opted to take a photo of it as opposed to photocopying it. Most because light is actually one of the biggest detriments to books. Um, if you ever go to old libraries and you see like, uh, one section is dark and one section is light. It's because the, it's been sitting in front of a window and it, the light hits it at a certain angle. And so it just lightens this thing. So photocopying paper, uh, like especially old paper like that, does hurt the actual item. So I would never be able to do that. Um, but the microfilm, microfilm is easily accessible and we have a great, sadly, it's not open to the public right now, the Reference Free Public Library, but our microfilm collection is pretty extensive. And we also have, we have a good chunk of the London Times too, and like other repositories, which is kind of interesting, mm -hmm. but we have two different machines. We have the traditional microfilm machines and the newer one, which is the Scantron. And the Scantron 3000 is a beauty because I can save it uh, directly from there, upload it to the website or to email it to myself or whatever. And it's a little bit use more user-friendly than I think most intimidating giant machines, but I'm used to using those machines, but. I will say there is an extra benefit um, with the Scantron because it allows us to use light technology essentially to kind of make it better. So like that version of the, um, that little ad that I showed, the anti-vote ad uh, was really dark and I had to like play with it and I could do that right from that software, which is really convenient as opposed to like what I typically do is I will take a photo or if I can scan an object and then retroactively load it onto like Adobe or something like that and play with it to manipulate to see better. Um, so like, thankfully the Scantron does all the work for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious because um, I'm just curious. I want to see it like visually wise and that because it was cool. Like seeing like, sorry to say how old the paper looked and that was like really cool. <laughs> I liked how it faded and that was really cool. <laughs> Mostly um, for archives in general that are, even though we are open to the public, there are certain objects that are like handled with care and only people who know how to actually handle that with care should be handling those. And so a lot of the old book collections are kept in storage as opposed to there's usually a big sitting room and we have a lot of old high, um, yearbooks and like directories and other things that are like there. And also it's just some general interest, uh, local history books too. But you basically would have to ask uh, wash your hands beforehand, make sure they're very dry, and you would not, you would just be able to handle it and access it. And it, the understanding is that um, any good historian, as you saw, that I had parenth parentheticals of where I got that information. And so I would not, I would not show something without showing credit to where I got it. And the understanding is that if you're an academic, that's the bar you're setting. And if you don't, mm, that's, that's where you kind of get into issues of like, hey, that's not cool. <laughs> so basically you're going to have to handle it with kids' gloves. <laughs> Pretty much, especially paper. It is a very precious resource. 
Um, is it possible you had, can you send me the directly like you have copies of their whole directory or only like certain no. ones? No, there is no copies of the whole directory because there's no possible way to do that. And also if there was an effort to digitize it, that would require money. <laughs> and so oh, no, I was just curious, one. like uh, but no, the whole directory is not available. And again, I just picked that up randomly because I was like, oh, this is cute. And like saw it was a directory and I saw the year and I was like, I wonder, and lo and behold, it was there. Um, and which is pretty much 99% of archeology span and history <laughs> is like random, like, oh. <laughs> yeah, you find this random stuff and you're like, oh, why was this, this page marked? Why was this highlighted? Like, you know, like even though we're not supposed to do in our textbooks, we're not supposed to write on it or anything. <laughs> I hear you, but that's, I, I was fascinated how like, how you found that and it, like how much it looked like it was so old you made it feel like it was like it was an antique basically it was like really cool mandy you had a question yeah i love i love the sort of antique feel of the directory too that francesca was talking about but i'm i'm so impressed with some first of all awesome that was great good job um with some of the photos they are outstanding like so sharp and i'm the camera was invented by then, which is like, it always shocks everyone because people are like, the 1870s, like, oh, this, there's photos from the Civil War. And I'm like, yeah, they're, like the, the camera was technically around before the 1800s, but an actual like photograph could come out in like the 1840s. Um, we have some really great, eight, eight, the 1850s had a lot of cool ones, mostly because like people were still figuring out cameras. <laughs> and uh, And then when the video camera got invented too, those are like, gems as well <laughs> i love seeing the the pictures of the uh, old suffragettes in new bedford it was like ooh, goosebumps and it's very <laughs> um like to use modern terms like that branded content so like print um like uh, i kind of casually mentioned like social media and it's because like i was thinking about some social media stuff because anisha and i were talking <laughs> about memes and memes uh, as we kind of know are really rep uh, replicatable like they can repeat themselves easily they're quick and identifiable because of their visuals and early printing ads knew that and so like going through these old newspapers you see a similar font you see a similar aesthetic and this kind of art style and i would also qualify those as memes as well mostly because it is a visual like thing that we understand and we can immediately connect to and so for the suffragettes to brand themselves with those kind of signs that are very specific and their outfits that were very specific, it does kind of lend itself to be memeable even today. And it's a very a visual identifier that we can do. Yes, visual iconography of the suffragette movement, exactly. It's, uh, I know like, of course, my friends would say, so which some of you guys are here, uh, that I always talk about memes and it's mostly because memes are not really a new phenomenon just like when marie said that she was a radical socialist it is not anything new to our generation right now it's been kind of going on forever <laughs> but yeah i did love their aesthetic indeed i have to share this this was our newsletter yes so you recognize that and we like the photos too that's why we reproduce them and um and, and to Francesco's point, um, we had to request that we use this from the, from the New Bedford um, Whaling Museum Library. So they are the holders of this image. And um, everything changes in like the 20th century. There are owners of images, but there's always some owner that you um, have to request permission of because they are the owners. So we request permission to reproduce it. We never own the image ourselves. We just um, have the right to reproduce, but only for this purpose. And then we have to give it certain credit. And that's very common in the art world too. So um, we used an image inside uh, the other image um, by the New Bedford School building, which I'm so glad you looked that up because I was like, oh, there it is, that's it. Um, and I, I can see it now. But so that's how that, that works when museum to museum, if you're printing something, um, you know, research is one, one use and, I think archives generally want you to be able to use their material, right? They keep it and, and preserve it so that people can research it in the future. But if you want to just kind of use it and for something like marketing, 
um, then that's that's the practice. But you know, hopefully the New Bedford Whaling Museum let us use it for free. They might, if you wanted to produce like a poster, then maybe you pay a fee and it just supports the archive, right? So this is why I have a job because these are all the little things that museums um, do and, um, and archives do. And those boxes that Dan was referring to earlier, those solander boxes are very expensive, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, Very special I, cardboard boxes. I thankfully was awarded um, $625 from the local cultural council to kind of start this project. Um, 300 of it was getting boxes and special folders and um, and then little cute business cards with the Lupum Defundo uh, 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 logo because I was going to, I was actually supposed to line up to be a fellow with the National Park Service to kind of promote and also research specifically Elias Trotter because he's kind of the willing story here. Um, but, and we we're gonna have like outdoor events and be like, hi, this is the archive, come visit, let's do scannings of your digital, um, your images, kind of like what the Fishing Heritage Center here does. Uh, but sadly, COVID happened. So um, hopefully uh, I did get permission from the local cultural council we're gonna pick up again next year. So hopefully maybe something will happen. Um, because the other interesting thing, because we have to kind of think about these things uh, as like people who handle artifacts, um, we're getting these items from people's collections, their individual homes. Um, I would have to quarantine each item for a week to two weeks is what the new, because every day it kind of grows the length of how much we have to quarantine an item. And it also depends on what type of item it is. And prints and material, um, needless to say is kind of uh, porous and risky <laughs> um the like something i only know how to clean certain items uh but like plastics metals etc um are very complex and so you know you can't exactly bleach everything <laughs> uh and so that's what makes it kind of difficult collecting for the archive yes anisha I guess, I, I'm sorry, I just had a moment of shock. I'm like, you are cleaning these artifacts? But then I remembered it was an archive and not an archaeological yeah. collection. No. <laughs> and I, sorry, I resolved that. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, um, most of the stuff, it, like, in terms of, like, cleaning. So, like, we do have at the archive special collections, we have the Spooner Ernestina collection. So we actually have a piece of the burnt section when it was on fire. Um, so, like, of course, we can't clean that. So, like, what we do is we bag it, of course, and, like, I was allowed the privilege to handle it and photograph it. Uh, again, that's because I knew how. <laughs> um, but certain things like um, things we clean, uh, <laughs> mostly it's maintenance. So like we can't really do a lot if something is horribly damaged. Um, what I'll sometimes do is I'll scan it or take a photo of it mm -hmm. and clean it up digitally. So we have a cleaner copy that is a little bit more like better. Nice. Um, but physical items that we have cleaned, uh, mostly paintings. Paintings usually get cleaned. I only know how to do frames. I do not know how to actually do the actual art. That is something I do not know how to do. <laughs> um, that is a that is a specialist in and of itself. Um, but mostly like the the, the certain metals, like uh, how to clean the gold frames. Like there's like actual gold frames. Uh, I think there's two of. Um, I think it might be in the Ernestina collection because there was two portraits of the. Ernestina, who was named after, like the boat was named after, we have a portrait of them, and I think a few other portraits as well. And those gilded frames are always like so ostentatious and campy that they're kind of probably gay in them itself. <laughs> so why don't we take one more question, because we're closing in on the hour. Um, if there's any last questions, this has been great dialogue about nerdy topics. <laughs> I love it, the archives. Archives and cylinder boxes, woo-hoo. Uh, go ahead, Francesco. First of all, thank you for saying my name correctly this whole time. <laughs> um, I just wanna ask, can you send, I just sent you in the chat my address. I was wondering if you can send me um, a copy of those, the um, you just showed of uh, the newsletter that you have, if it's possible. I would love to share it back with my rainbow group with a couple of copies with them. I would be happy to do that. And, Thank uh, you. And I will mention that, um, as I said, Dan will be here again speaking specifically about this new LGBTQ archive that he's created. 
Um, that date is uh, October 27th. It's going to be a Zoom just like this one. It's Tuesday and it's 5.30, um, or should I say 5, <laughs> 5.30 p.m. <laughs> we'll talk um, again. We'll talk <laughs> to gay terms, 5.45, okay? <laughs> uh, we also have um, next week uh, on property, we actually have an in-person event. We are, if, you've, uh, if you like walking around in the fall and seeing jack-o'-lanterns on Thursday between 4 and 8, we're decking out our garden, which um, if you've ever been to the the museum here. We have a one acre plot and a garden and we're carving par pumpkins um, and decorating the, the, the yard with carved pumpkins and we'll have, um, we'll just be open for visitation. It's uh, just be nice to get out since we're doing so much computer work these days. So um, check us out online, check us out on Facebook. Um, thank you again, Dan, and thank I will you. see you in a few weeks, but um, thanks everyone for coming. And we'll yeah, see you thank soon. Thank you for everyone for showing up and hope you enjoyed. Yes, this was great.